I thought maybe one way of doing this, since I don't have a whiteboard behind me right now, is to share a Word doc. This simply has the three reading questions I put on the Canvas page. I thought I might type some notes on the screen under each of these and uh, maybe make available this, um, this document or the text of this document to you in a discussion afterwards. So I don't, I can't see people anymore, but I'm trusting that uh, this is at least worth a, worth a try as an experiment in replacement for writing on the board. All right, let's go then with the, the first question. Uh, Audi starts out talking about sources of knowledge and he mentions that the, uh, the typical ones, we consider uh, perception, memory, consciousness, or sort of self-reflection, introspection, and reason, and he adds testimony as well as one that's not basic. But the first question I asked was, what is this idea of basicness when it comes to beliefs? What is it that makes a belief basic? Would anybody care to uh, um, make a suggestion on that front? This is on page 72, right? I do. Uh, this is me, Pat. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Um, so it doesn't depend on uh, anything else or any of the other sources for its justification. Maybe we, another way to say it, perhaps, it doesn't depend on any other source for its justificatory power. So uh, we would say, this is in the middle of 72, right? To call source basic, it yields knowledge without any positive dependence on the operation of some other source of knowledge or justification. I guess I should say um, justifiable power, but since that gets us under the hood and sort of inside into the components of knowledge, we can at least say a basic source is a source that does not depend on another source for its giving us knowledge. So we would say let's say in or in or through themselves. So example, right? What I know through perceiving, perceiving alone, perceiving however we've defined it, taking into account all the components that it has, is enough for me to have the knowledge that comes from perceiving. And he gives some examples, and I think I think um, the examples are relatively clear, right? When I perceptually know that the clock says ten by virtue of seeing its face displaying the time, then I, I have this kind of basic source of knowing. Nobody has to has to, I don't have to back it up uh, against challenge in any other way. Uh, we do get something here, some interesting, something interesting at the bottom of page, um, page 72, which I guess I'll put outside of the reading questions because it's not specifically addressed to the question that I ask. Um, he talks about the, depend, the seeming dependence of perception on memory, since I need to not just perceive, but remember that I perceived or connect my perception with a memory that I've had previously of what a 10 o'clock clock face looks like. He considers a sort of um, hypothetical scenario where one might acquire the ability, uh, the sort of the, the categories necessary to understand the thing at the same time, simultaneously with the perception, um, to show that there, there's 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 no strict conceptual dependence. But the uh, the the idea I wanted to draw your attention to at the very bottom of page seventy two is that the category of let's see, it appears that neither perceptual knowledge. Although perceptual knowledge ordinarily depends on a certain, in a certain way on memory, neither the concept of perception nor the concept of perceptual knowledge is historical. This is something I wanted to um, Perception is not historical. Memory, it seems, is historical that at least in this sense, one cannot remember something unless one has retained it in memory over some period of time. Uh, 
And I think part of what he means here is that um, perception by its nature is or can be instantaneous. It doesn't seem to require anything beyond itself as in order to be perception, in order to be a source of knowledge. Although we perceive in time, the perceptual act itself doesn't seem to be historical, stretched out across time in the way that the memory act is historical. Memory always involves pulling back into my present consciousness something that was previously placed in my mind, whether deliberately or sort of tacitly. Uh, that seems important to me because we're we're look if we're going to be looking at the way in which we know, we should be able to separate out the parts of the, the ways in which the different parts of our knowing apparatus depend or don't depend upon our our temporality, so to speak, our our um, embeddedness in time. Um, he goes on to talk about a few more factors about memory on page seventy three. Uh, there is about about perception. He says. There's a kind of negative dependence upon non-perceptual factors, maybe worth noting, middle of page 73. What he means by this, I think, is that there is my perception depends upon my not being aware of or not perceiving the presence of other things which might be blockers of my belief. So his example um, My son's mischievous use of mirrors, which I remember as an event, would block then my usual knowledge, my usual perceptual knowledge that the clock is showing, uh, a ten, the clock shows 10 o'clock. So my perceiving the clock being in one way seems to be at the very least subject to being canceled or revised or blocked by some factor outside of the perceptual act itself. So I take those things into account but it's simply a negative dependence. Uh, he also says on page 73 towards the bottom that he's talking about the relation between perception and consciousness and the way in which um, there seems to be a causal relation between the object of perception and what other, what other ever sensation it pro is produced by it. Uh, I got some people with hands raised. So uh, let me get uh, Aaron and then Pat and Dave, Pat and or David. Sorry, I, I have trouble reading some of the things in there. Go ahead, go ahead, Aaron, you're, you're, you're first. Sure. Um, is he, so yeah, when, he, when he's talking about um, factors, yeah, like factors beyond, beyond perception, is, is he, I don't, it sounded like he was talking about like selective attention, um, selective hearing, that kind of thing. Is that sort of what he's, is, is that, or is that only tangential to what he's discussing here? I, I suppose select, selective hearing, I'm not quite sure what you mean by selective hearing, but I, I think his point is more general that the, uh, the knowledge that comes from perception is, is subject to maybe we might say contextual revision. So, if it takes place in a certain context, I uh, withhold or cancel my um, confidence in it. And it's, it's, I, I thought of the mirror thing, not so much in terms of a mischievous son, but that because uh, the, the digital clock at the foot of my bed uh, do, uh, uh, can be seen from a mirror when I'm lying in bed, just the particular geography of my room. And so it does happen that if the, if the, the time has the right number of twos and fives in it, that being shown on a digital clock, you know, are mirror images of each other. I can actually look in the mirror and see the mirror image of the, and if I'm not attentive, I, co I come to the conclusion, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's 525 
instead of 252 or something like that. Um, so, so this this fact of seeing a clock that's a mirror image, a clock without numbers on it, you know, ten o'clock and two o'clock would look the same reflected in the mirror. It's obvious that I adjust my beliefs based upon perceptual knowledge in just that way. That I allow them to be canceled out by contextual clues, other by by memories or other perceptions that I've had or have had. <clears throat> So that I think that's the only point that he's making. I think we could say selective hearing might be a special case of that, but I think the, the principle itself is more general. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure. Pat and David, you guys had a hand up also? Yeah, it's me, Pat. Um, so just to re summarize negative dependence, I thought I was having trouble understanding it. So it, it essentially means there existing no barriers. So it's like Keteris Paribus, like all other variables being equal, like there's no barriers that exist. Right. Correct? Okay. Yeah. So no, nothing blocking the perception. That, that makes sense. Right. It, it, it's like it, it's, it's controlling for the presence of blockers. It's saying Ceteris Paribus or absent any blocking or countervailing, you know, negative evidence. Um, there could be barriers. These would be negatives on the knowledge, right? I think maybe the way to think about negative dependence, I'm assuming here from the way he describes it in the language that he uses, positive dependence would be something like it being a necessary condition. And he's not talking about a necessary condition here. He's talking about the absence of blockers, the absence of contrary negatives. So it's like something like having a, having a veto power. I might say, if Congress passes a law, provided the president doesn't veto it, it becomes law. So the president has a negative, uh, it, it might say in a sense, Congress's will is negatively dependent upon the president's assent. Uh, in the same way that pr the president's, actually the president's, president's appointment of Supreme Court justices has a positive dependence on the will of the Senate as it's current presently interpreted. The Senate has to give an affirmative vote they don't just have a negative, they are required to give an affirmative. Pat, does that help sketch out the distinction between what I think he means by negative and positive dependence? Yeah, thank you. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, I have uh, a AJ, so that's Mr. Jackson in the chat. Uh, I don't know if this is too soon. I believe that he's gonna make his next move to stress that our internal world, such as our senses are very important since senses are linked to memory. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think we'll, we'll take a look at where he's going with perce uh, well, perception. We're only just getting now at the sort of a bare sketch of what perception is like as a source. So one thing we've gotten, it, it seems to be not historical in the way memory is. It seems to have a negative dependence upon factors outside of the act itself in a way that we might say that certain internal knowledge by reflection is not. So to know that I am in pain or to know that I am thinking about whatever I am aware of thinking about, sort of Descartes style, this does not seem to require um, to, to, to have a sort of negative dependence upon anything other than it. In order to know that I'm thinking, I have only to think and to reflect upon my thinking, which is itself another act of thought. There is no contextual factor I would need to take into account not even the existence of the evil genius or of the mad scientist uh, manipulating my brain in a vat would be sufficient to defeat my confidence through introspection that I know that I'm thinking, that that's following Descartes' line of thought. So maybe that's one way we can link that as well. Um, let me make sure, it's, it's 924. Uh, I wanted to make sure we talked about memory and testimony at least a little bit. We can continue with some of this for next time. Um, it talks about memory as a partial, partially causal notion, perception not being a closed concept. Let me jump ahead though to uh, memory. I asked about the cases for and against calling memory a basic source. I think Audi is uh, of the opinion that it should not be called a basic source. Uh, why was that? Uh, somebody, somebody, speak up since I can't see everybody on the screen at once. Uh, Doctor Yes, sir. Go ahead. 
Uh, would it be because that, I mean, for something to be, if something is basic, it doesn't need to be justified by something else, but just because you remember, remember something doesn't mean it's right, so your memory still needs to be justified. I think it's it's going to be different from that, I think. I think you're confusing the idea of a basic belief, which we've talked about briefly and we'll get into more later when we talk about foundationalism. He's not talking about a basic belief, but about a basic source of knowledge. And as a basic source, it doesn't depend upon any other source, but it's not that it could be or might not be fallible. That's not the issue that comes in. What he says at the bottom of page 74 is it's a mistake to think that memory is a basic source. It is an essential source, but it's not basic. It's not basic because uh, I'm only able to remember things that I have acquired from some other source, from a uh, from perception, from introspection. Uh, and so it's always going to be, we might say, uh, a secondary, a secondary source of knowledge. It is a primary source, he thinks, a basic source of justification, but not a full source of knowledge itself, since it only brings back out what has already been put in. Um, he considers consciousness, or what I've called introspection, briefly at the top of page 76, in just a single paragraph. And it might be worth noting, just to come back to later, that uh, Descartes attaches a lot of attention, a lot of significance to the things that I know by, interest, by pure introspection. This is the sort of rationalist playground of epistemology. The place I find the primary truths and the innate ideas is through introspective self-examination is by thinking about things in that stove heated room withdrawing from the world of the senses and the like. Um, he talks about reason and talks about the way in which reason uh, seems to be fundamental uh, and requires reasoning forward. There is something unusual about reason in the sense that reasoning for conclusions does seem to involve us in um, dependent knowing that, that, our, that our knowledge of the conclusion seems to follow from or depend upon our belief in and knowledge of the premises and of the rational rules of inference. Uh, let me, in the last 10 minutes or so here, if we are gonna end a little bit early to go to a, to go to a discussion, um, talk about testimony and its differences. Let me just to vary the screen a little bit. Um, ask you guys, what are some of the differences that he identifies between testimony, and this is since, since Thomas Reed, a, a modern philosopher, um, pointed out, you know, most of what we know is based upon testimony of others. People tell us things and we believe them. What, uh, what makes testimony uh, distinct from these other sources and perhaps therefore not, not basic? Any initial suggestion? We're on pages, uh, pages 80 to 81 right now. We can come back to testimony if we like. Feel free to speak up. I can't see hands. Right doesn't he he kind of says that testimony uh, doesn't like generate memory that in the way that other sources, or generate uh, knowledge, excuse me, in ways that other sources would. Um, okay. So he compares that with memory and that we need um, some sort of outside thing that kind of is causal towards our, our form of knowing through testimony. Right. I forgot I need to share the screen if I want you to see what I'm typing. By the way, is the typing working for people? Is it okay? Yes, yes, definitely. All right, I'll keep I'll keep doing this as an alternative to a whiteboard for the time being, as long as I can type well and the noise doesn't noise of the clicking keys doesn't bother you guys. Um, there are four further points. He says, well, I'm top page eighty. There, the point that the testimony is a source of basic knowledge distinguishes it from other non-basic sources of knowledge, such as inference. The point also helps explain why it's a natural to consider testimony as a basic source of knowledge for it is typical such sources to yield non-inferential knowledge. But there are four further points that distinguish testimony from the basic sources. First, one cannot test the reliability of a basic source or confirm a deliverance of it without relying upon that very source. 
Okay, but with testimony, it seems it can, with perception one must look again. With memory, must one try harder to recall. With testimony, one can check reliability by using any of the basic sources. Okay, so I think it may be that it, it we call it not basic because it can be tested by other sources, but one of the features of basic sources is that they can only be tested by themselves. To test my perception, I have to look again. To test my introspection, I have to reflect again. To test my memory, I have to try harder to recall. I have to recall again. But to check testimony, I go see if you have testified truly. I go investigate the, we might say, the facts of the case. And so testimony, though it's important and it gives us uh, a significant portion of our knowledge, doesn't seem to share that same trait with the basic features. The second point's already been suggested in connection with memory. Memory is central for our knowledge at any given moment in the way testimony is not. Even if knowledge could not be acquired without the benefit of testimony, once we climb the linguistic ladder, we can discard it and given Norman memory, retain what we know. Okay. So what's this? What's, how do I summarize this point here? I can actually dispense with believing in testimony theoretically, although perhaps not practically being a social being. Consciousness and perception are essential for the development of new knowledge in their domains. There is no domain for which continued testimony is in principle needed for increase of knowledge. There's no special domain in which testimony is absolutely necessary in order to form knowledge in that domain. The third point, a subtler point, there's a sense which testimony based on belief passes through the will or at least through agency. The attester must select what to attest and in the process can also lie. And this is part of what makes testimony such a social source of knowledge in some ways that makes it, uh, we might say, more uniquely human than perception or the use of the senses, which we share with our fellow animals. There is a way in which I have to credit the goodwill of the testifier. This is especially the case when I'm trusting an expert. When somebody says, trust the expert on this particular issue. I have to know that the expert is an expert and that the expert has goodwill and is willing to tell me the truth and has no, we might say, uh, negative uh, dependent blocker that would prevent that person from telling the truth or from deserving my, my uh, credit, my belief. Uh, page 81, just to wrap this up in the next couple of minutes, the fourth point of contrast has already been suggested. The, base, the need for grounds for the semantic interpretation of what is said on the basis of which it is taken to be that P. This is not a justificatory epistemic burden intrinsic to the standard basic sources. We need grounds for the semantic interpretation of what is said on the basis of what it, of which it is taken to be P. So, so cleaning that up a little bit. I have to interpret the meaning of the other person of their testimony. I have to interpret what their words mean in order to understand what belief it is to credit. This doesn't seem to happen with perception uh, or memory or these other sources, it looks like, um, uh, to take an example, you know, if, if I'm listening to testimony, I have to sift out what is meant by and what is, what is true and what is false in the testimony. If you've ever done some historical reconstruction from documents, you realize that there are often things you need to discard that are in the text and things that you need to bring into play in forming your conclusions that are not present in the text that might be omitted or denied in the text. So historical reconstruction, I think, plays uh, is a place where that plays an important role. Um, bottom of page 81, these contrasts between testimony and the basic sources are not meant to impugn testimony 
in addition to being a source of basic knowledge, though not a basic source of knowledge, testimony is like memory an essential source for our overall knowledge. We might say that memory and testimony transmit knowledge, but don't generate it. So if we think of the basic sources as being generative of knowledge. Okay. That's as far as I think I wanna go right now. I don't see any hands up or any more texts in the chat. Uh, are there other comments or questions that people have? Okay, sort of a basic read over of some of the components of these different sources of knowledge, ways of thinking about them, ways of classifying them as being basic or essential, but not basic. Basic here having a particular sort of self, self-contained, if not quite self-justifying quality to it. If there are no direct questions, I think what I'll do is um, end this Zoom call a little bit early. I know people have to get to class in the next uh, 20 minutes or so for the 10 o'clock class. Uh, I'm going to ask you to read the remainder of chapter two, the second half of it, for Friday. Friday's class, I believe, will be just like this one in format, uh, Zoom, perhaps followed by discussion. I will create a discussion in the next couple of minutes on Canvas and uh, email you guys about it. I'll leave that open for the next two days to uh, for as, and I'll ask you to post some comments, thoughts, reactions to this, and I'll try making that a standard part of the class on Friday and see how that goes. Last chance for any questions. All right, as with before, I'll post the video of this to uh, YouTube and post the link in the video links discussion. I hope you guys have a good day. Uh, take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you again uh, soon, both on Zoom and uh, in person eventually. So please keep me in your prayers. Goodbye. So